so good to see you all here today. You know, the Bible says the Lord rewards those who seek Him. And I believe this is a way in which we can seek Him. And so I pray that you'll be blessed by our time in the Word. If you would, uh, join me please in turning to the New Testament book of Colossians. And uh, we're going to jump into what will be the final study in our series through Colossians. This is week 13 in this great undertaking. And uh, I've enjoyed it very much. I hope many of you have learned and grown through it. And the title for this series has been Enough. And the reason for that is because the theme of the book of Colossians is the sufficiency of Jesus Christ. We've learned that Jesus is enough and more than enough for our needs for spiritual salvation. He's enough when it comes to sustaining us and strengthening us. He's enough even in the relationships in the course of our lives. Jesus enables us to live life to the fullest. He directs us. He empowers us each step of the way. Colossians is a pretty deep book of the Bible. It spends a lot of time on the doctrine of Christology or the doctrine of Jesus Christ, a deep letter for a church that needed it desperately. And friends, we needed this letter in our day and in our church as well. Great book. And then we come to these last verses. And I've got to tell you, when I look at what is the last eight of this book, it seems to me to just kind of be a list more or less of names. I looked at this for a long time and I thought, what in the world am I going to do with these verses? It, it's kind of like driving from uh, Bakersfield to Fresno. There's just nowhere good to stop. You just, you just got to power through and get to where it is you're going. And, and here we have this last eight of the book. And, and I'll be honest with you, as we headed into this series together, I, as we got started, I was already thinking of what am I going to do when I get to the end of this book? I, I don't know what to do. And in the interest of full transparency, I studied this passage. I wrote a complete sermon. It was fine. It was factual. And I threw it in the garbage can because it did not pass the so what test. And I thought, all right, let me get back and study this text. And I had to really go to the point where we were when we started our study together. Who wrote this? To whom were they writing? What was the occasion? What was going on? And, and I was reminded Paul was writing this letter to a church, certainly because he wanted to help them. A church located in a part of the world where East meets West, and there were so many different influences. It was a time and a place where spirituality was accepted, but Christ alone was not. Rather than saying, I'm a devoted follower of Jesus, people were content to just say, I'm a spiritual person, and so spirituality was accepted. Christ alone was not. Pluralism, or the blending of religions and philosophies, was accepted. The simplicity of the gospel was not accepted. At that time, everybody was celebrating tolerance. They just felt so enlightened and so broad-minded. They were tolerant for everything except the gospel message. It was, in fact, a time and place not too different than our time in our place, and and so Paul wrote this book of the Bible, and he did so, yes, to straighten some things out, but he wasn't coming in like a bull in a china shop just wanting to slam everybody. He had to correct some things that were wrong, but his goal was ultimately to help them so they could move forward for God. When I revisited that purpose, I began to look at this final section of names that we're going to see, and, and I saw it in a different light. This wasn't just Paul wrapping up a letter by saying, tell your family I said hi, my family says hi to you, and tell Bob at work I said hi. It, it was more than that. How many of you would agree with me that there's not a wasted word in the Bible? And so as we come to this text, we see some incredible things that reveal the heart of the Apostle Paul. And I want us to read this text understanding that Paul was a real man who really wanted what was best for this church. And I want us to realize he was working with real people. He was writing to real people who really needed what he had to say. There's value for us in these last verses we'll study here in Colossians. If you're able, I'll invite you to join me in standing. As we look today, Colossians 4, and we finished last week in verse 6, so we're going to pick it up this week in verse 7. As we read these names, I'll point out in advance, someone could possibly say to me, Pastor, you mispronounce one of the names. Let's clarify that right now. I'll probably mispronounce all of the names, all right? Unusual names, I tried to look at them phonetically, and I've practiced them, and uh, I'll probably get it wrong nonetheless. H however, these people would probably think Steve was a weird name, okay? So these are just cultural names. Verse 7, 
All my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you. And Marcus, sister son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And Jesus, which is called Justice, who are of the circumcision, these only are my fellow workers unto the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you, and them that are Laodicea, and them in Hierapolis. Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, greet you. Salute the brethren which are in Laodicea, and Nymphus, and the church which is in his house. And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul, remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. I want you to take note of really those last words Paul shares here. Grace be with you. Someone who understands grace from the biblical context understands it's presupposed in that that Jesus is enough. It's not we do our best and he makes up the difference. It's all of Jesus. He is enough. Father, we thank you for this morning and I pray that you would continue working. Lord, how we need this. Open our hearts to this truth. We ask in your name. Amen. Thank you so much. You may be seated. He was a type A leader who was right in the middle of things, but he was also a man who saw the value in times of seclusion for the purpose of refocusing and refueling. In fact, long seasons in his life were lived that way for the purpose of reading the Bible, of studying, and of spending time in prayer. But at the same time, he was a man who personally and passionately loved people. In fact, as you study the writings of the Apostle Paul, it's interesting that he mentions more than 100 people by name. This was a man that knew people and loved people. In Romans chapter 16 alone, he mentions 23 different people by name. And here in the final chapter of the short book of Colossians, he mentions 10 people's names in these few verses we've just read together. I think we can glean from all of that the value, the importance of knowing people and having friends and of doing the Christian life in community. Certainly that is important. As we look here, we see that Paul is mentioning different things about different people. But beyond that, and more than that, I believe what we find in these important words in the Bible are words that reveal the heart of Paul. I think we can look within Paul's heart and in his mind and see what it is that was important to him as he closes this letter. They reveal to us, I believe, the kind of culture that Paul thought was important in the life of a believer and in the life of a church. And I want us to think of these words today in light of that. What kind of culture would the Apostle Paul have wanted in the church at Colossae and in the church here at Coastline? As we look at this text together, first of all, I believe Paul teaches us we need to have a culture of encouragement. Let's look at verses 7 and 8 again, discover what it is that we found there. The, the Bible says this, all my state shall Tychicus declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. Now, Tychicus, the first one we 
find in this list of names was a good and faithful brother. Paul called him here a faithful minister. Faithful meaning dependable. Minister meaning a servant. Paul said, let me tell you about Tychicus. He is a dependable worker in the work of God. In fact, Paul went on to say of Tychicus in this text that he was a fellow servant in the Lord. Paul was saying there that Tychicus was the kind of man who without reservation had given his life to God and said, God, use me in any way you see fit. He was a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. And, and, and so Paul said, I'm sending the best guy I got here. And he went on to tell them why he was sending Tychicus, that he might know of your estate and comfort your hearts. Paul said, all right, here he's coming. He's the faithful guy. He's the serving guy. He's yielded his life to the Lord. And Paul said, and I'm sending him to you that he might comfort your hearts. The word comfort is used there. It means to alleviate sorrows and distress to give strength, to console, to encourage. And friends, I want you to know today that encouragement is something we're all to be a part of in terms of giving it to others. Paul valued encouragement. He sent one of his best co-laborers to do something that he could not do because he was in prison. And, and, and off this man went Tychicus. But it's, it's interesting to me. It's, it's even better than that. Paul sent Tychicus for the purpose of being an encourager. Tychicus carried the letter from Paul from Rome all the way to Colossae to a church that would open the letter and read it. So let's just imagine we're in Colossae today, and uh, one of you is Tychicus, and they hand the letter to whoever's going to read it in church, and they open it up, and as they're reading, they mention the name Tychicus, and he would have paid attention. When your name is said in church, you typically want to know what's going on. And Paul, who sent Tychicus to be an encourager, he, he writes about Tychicus encouraging things. Paul said, I want to encourage the one who's going to go do the encouraging in the lives of others. This is a matter of culture. We should be people that are consumed with putting courage into the lives of others. Friends, of all the places in our lives, we should be able to come to receive the encouragement we need in the course of life. A church family should be that place where we can have the word of God brought into our lives and friendships brought into our lives. If our church is to continue for God, it is vital that we each do our part to encourage those around us. And you know what I know about a bunch of you? You're really good at that. I've been on the receiving end of some of you who've just wanted to be an encouragement, but I have found that a lot of people are probably like me. Sometimes I'll entertain a thought of encouragement without sharing that encouragement. You know, if we want to have a culture like this in our church, we need to be people that when someone does something, we recognize it. We speak up. We say thank you. If someone is doing well, let them know. It ought to be the goal of each of our lives to put courage into those around us. This should be our culture, a culture of encouragement. But Paul goes on here, I believe in verse 9, and we see that this should also be a place where we have a culture of family. If you're still with me, say amen. amen. Verse 9, we meet a man by the name of Onesimus. Onesimus. Now, we're going to hear a little bit more about him in a moment, but uh, I want you to uh, notice that Paul wrote here, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother. Now, look up here for a minute. That's what he just said about the first guy. Faithful and beloved brother. He talks about that. And here's Onesimus. He's a faithful and beloved brother. Later in verse 14, he writes of Luke that Luke is the beloved physician. And we found that when the word beloved is in the Bible, it means you be loved. In verse 15, Paul writes, salute the brethren. I'm pointing all of this out so you understand. Paul is using terms of endearment and terms of family as it relates to the body of Christ. That's a great thought for us to con consider. Coastline, listen. If we are to move forward as a church, we have to understand that we can't just become an organization. We're an organization. No, 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 no. We're, we're much more than that. Uh, we've got to understand, we're more than just a place that hosts a Sunday morning event. We're more than a business that produces religious goods and services. You see, if you're a believer today, you weren't just saved from hell unto an eternal relationship with God. You have been saved from hell, but you've been saved into the body of Christ. It is God's will that you would participate with the family of God. There must be a culture of family. So we have to wonder, how do we cultivate a culture of family? Well, I believe at Coastline, and it's probably done a lot of different places in different ways, and that's all great. I think at Coastline, one of the best ways to cultivate a culture of family is through our small groups, getting together with people that you know. I, I think a room like this, it's fine for preaching and teaching. This is not a great venue for building friendships and, and relationships. I think small groups, they're really a must if you want to participate in family life, especially at Coastline. I know another way to do this is through serving together. 
serving. It helps. Remember a couple years ago, my brother, his name's Paul. Many of you know him. He's a preacher as well. He has preached here. And he said, hey, Steve, I'm, I'm hosting a retreat for some pastors at our family farm back in Colorado. He said, why don't you come? The retreat would be a blessing to you. And beyond that, since you already know the area, you can kind of help me host it. And uh, I said, sure, that sounds good. So uh, I went back there and doing my best to help and I and, uh, wanted to free him up as much as possible to talk more with folks. And I was kind of doing behind the scenes stuff. And, and uh, my, my brother called me over and there was another pastor there who I didn't know. And he said, uh, you two guys need to get to know each other. And then he walked off. Now, if you know anything about me, that's just like the worst thing anyone can do to me. You know, talk about putting me on the spot. And unfortunately, that other pastor had a personality kind of like mine. So we each grabbed a cup of coffee. We sat down and we stared at each other, you know, and tried to think, what do we say? So it's like, so you're a pastor? Yeah, me too. And where do you pastor? And you have a family. And oh, we did our best to work our way through this conversation. I'm horrible at small talk. He was horrible at small talk. It was the most awkward conversation ever. We were both glad it was done. We did what we were supposed to do. We tried to get to know one another. And I was glad that was the end of that. Uh, we had a session after that where there was some teaching, and then there was a little bit of free time. And back in Colorado, we've had that bark beetle. It's all over the southwest uh, and, and northwest. It's killed a lot of pine trees, and we had a bunch of them down on our property, and I'd already spent some time cutting them up, and I hadn't yet split the firewood. So I thought, free time, uh, I'm going to split some firewood. If I was a lumberjack, I would hate splitting firewood, but I'm a pastor, so I just love it, okay? It's just like, it's, it's therapeutic for me, cathartic. So I got my gloves and got my axe, and I'm walking out the door, and that pastor that I had the awkward conversation with said, you need some help? And uh, I said, yeah, sure. I got him some gloves, uh, had another axe, and we went out there. You know what? For the next hour, we split wood, we laughed, we told stories, and we began a friendship. I don't know what it is about guys. We don't always do well face-to-face. Shoulder to shoulder, we're good. Agree on a cause? We're good. Heading in the same direction? Yeah, listen, friends, it, it's like that in the work of God. Serving together builds a bond. One of the best things you can do to cultivate a culture of family in a church is determine to serve in that church. Now, as I went through this list of names, it was a pretty diverse group, and I want to do justice to the text, so we're going to go through every name, and I'm going to give you this much of their bio, a little bit of their resume, if you would. And so in verse 7, we meet Tychicus. What do we know about Tychicus? Well, he was a pastor, and he traveled to Rome to visit Paul, and and, uh, he carried Paul's letter back to the church. In fact, he not only carried this book we call Colossians, he carried Ephesians and Philemon as well. The next one we meet is in verse 9, Onesimus. What do we know of him? Well, he was a runaway slave from this area in Colossae. He runs away to Rome and runs into a guy named Paul, as in the Apostle Paul. (laughs) What does Paul do? He tells him about Jesus Christ. And this young man gets saved. And Paul said, you really need to go back and make things right with the guy that owns you. He was a slave. We find in verse 10, Aristarchus, and he was a a prisoner. Paul just says here, he's a fellow prisoner, but he was quite a guy. He was with Paul in Ephesus when a riot broke out. You can read of that in Acts 17. He was with Paul one time when they had a shipwreck. You can read of that in Acts 19. And then in verse 10, we read of a man by the name of Mark. Mark is an interesting guy. He was a missionary. He was with Paul and Barnabas on their very first missionary journey. He kind of got tired, and it was hard, and I want to go home, and he did. He quit. And then he thought, I've made a horrible mistake. I want to come back and I want to go on more missionary journeys. And Paul said, no, not with me or not. And they had a falling out. It was bad. In fact, Barnabas, who was the uncle to this guy, he's like, Paul, if you're going to be that way, I'm not going with you anymore. They had a big blowout over it. But years later, apparently Paul and Mark have have reconciled and, and we find his name mentioned here. In verse 11, we find Jesus or justice and uh, unknown. We don't really know much about him. I'm glad God can use unknown people. And then we uh, come in in verse, uh, uh, let me see here, verse 12, we find Epaphras. He was a church planner, as we've seen, probably uh, started Colossae. In verse 14, we meet Luke. He was a medical doctor, a companion of Paul's, a great author and historian. Some of you heard me say the Apostle Paul's written more of the New Testament than any other person. That is technically correct, 
in terms of books of the Bible, but if you just counted up words in the New Testament, Luke wrote even more than Paul did. A very thorough historian, a great, great man of God. In verse 14, we meet Demas. He's a missionary. Interestingly enough, later on, we're going to find out Demas gets his eyes on the world. He starts living for material things, and he quits a life of ministry of dedication to Jesus Christ. Verse 15, we meet a guy by the name of Nymphus. He was a house church host. I think we can make application in our context to maybe a small group leader. He hosted a group, a smaller group of of believers uh, for the purpose of Bible study and prayer. Verse 17, we meet uh, Archippus, and he was a struggling new pastor. Probably what happened when Epaphras went to Rome to talk with Paul about what was happening in Colossae, it kind of looks to me as though Archippus was the guy that had to step up and serve as as pastor there, and uh, he he was having a tough time. And then in verse 18, of course, we see Paul's name again. He was an apostle prior to that. He was a persecutor of the church, a killer of Christians. What an interesting collection of people. Now, why did I just go through all those names with you? You talk about an eclectic group, people from different ethnicities, pastors, lay people, missionaries, wealthy homeowners, poor slaves, but they all found commonality in the cause that they shared. They were all followers of Jesus, and the church was better for their involvement. Just about anybody that came to Colossae that visited that church, they could look in the back doors and look around and find someone that was, hey, they're like me. And I think that's a beautiful thing in a church when it reflects the demographics of their community. So I was studying this, I got to wondering. So I looked it up online. What I'm about to share with you must be correct. I found it on the internet, okay? Oceanside, 48.3% white, 26.3% Hispanic, 7.4% Asian, 4.5% black. And then there were others, uh, it said Pacific Islanders, Native Hawaiians, American Indians, and and another segment, uh, multiracial. And uh, I, I want our church to know, I believe that a healthy church is one where the demographics of the community are also the demographics of the congregation. They say that Sunday is the most segregated day of the week. And I want you to know we're not to be like these progressive woke universities that want to have their own graduation for every every segment of society. We're not to be that way. It seems interesting to me. I thought we got over segregation a generation or so ago and we're kind of going back that way. If there's to be any institution in all of the world that opens their arms to everybody and means it, it's to be us. It's to be the church. And if we don't like that, we're not going to like heaven very much. Because John, as he saw heaven revealed unto him, he he wrote in Revelation 5, he said, They sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You know what he saw when he looked in heaven? A little bit of everybody. It's a healthy church that mirrors the area in which they serve. And I want to say today to everybody, I'm looking for eyeballs. I want to say to everyone that's in this room, I don't much care where you come from. You are wanted, and you're needed, and you're appreciated. And you bring to this church family different gifts and talents and abilities and experiences and and a different perspective and, and a different background. And we're made better because you are in the room today. It's to be all about a culture that understands that and celebrates that. God's desire for his children is that we would serve him as a family. That leads us to the third area I see Paul emphasize here. A culture of appreciation for the Bible. If we're still friends, say amen. Good. If we're still family, say amen. All right, very good. Just checking. I have some family members I'm not very friendly with, so I had to clarify there where we stand. All right, verse 16, we find uh, something that is interesting, and before I read what I'm going to read, you know, when Paul wrote the book of Colossians, we know he was inspired by God the Spirit, and in time, this would be included into the canon of Scripture, become a part of our New Testament, and we would understand this to be the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And as Paul writes here, listen to what he says in verse 16. He said, and when this epistle, epistle just means letter, 
He said, and when this book of the Bible, Colossians, I've just written this, is read among you. The understanding was it would be read. I want you to know that since the beginning of the church, great attention and appreciation has been shown for God's word. When it, when it all started, the very earliest church in the first century in Acts 2 and verse 42, the Bible says there, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What is doctrine? It just means taught truth. Well, where did the apostles get their doctrine? Well, they had the Old Testament scriptures, and then they had Jesus Christ who taught them. So the apostles, they had this Old Testament truth, and it's filtered through an understanding that they received from Jesus. They received their message from Jesus. They passed it on. It was all about the word of God. And Coastline, hear me today. If we fail uh, to preach and teach and live by the Bible, we've surrendered the privilege to be known as a church. To be based on the word of God. We believe God's word to be the final authority in all matters of faith and how we live our life. We believe the words of Paul to Timothy when he said, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine and for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It is our desire to take God's word seriously. I don't want to take myself too seriously, but I want to make sure I'm taking God's word word very seriously when we built this room out to serve as the primary place where we would have teaching and preaching we did some things first if, if you were to take the time and pull up the carpet you find prayers written all over the wall uh, floor in here tear the drywall sheetrock off you find prayers written on the wall you find names of people that folks who were here at that time were praying would come here and get saved You'd find names of people who were struggling, maybe in need of physical healing or a relationship that wasn't right. This whole room, I mean, we're surrounded in prayers right now. But another thing we did is this. If, if you were to take the wood up off this platform and then get beneath the plywood under that, you'd find there's a cavity directly beneath where I'm standing right now that we hollowed out and we intentionally left it there. And if you were to take the time to cut all the way through that, you would find that in there is a copy of God's Word. When, when I'm standing here, I'm literally standing on the promises of God as I'm teaching you the promises of God. And all of that was a reminder to our church at that time and a weekly reminder to me as I stand here that nothing of value can be said from behind this sacred desk that is not based on and coming from the word of God. Friends, we need a culture that appreciates the word of God. This idea of uh, relative truth and all of these things, it's all a bunch of nonsense. We, we can find the truth of God's word. I've, I've seen a lot of kinds of churches in my Christian life, and I'm not preaching to all them. I'm preaching to this one, so I'm not being critical. I'm trying to help our church understand some things about the need for a culture that appreciates the word of God. But I've seen some churches that they were really strong on church, but they seemed angry about it. Arr, we got the truth. Arr, not real happy people. And I've seen other people who, they had a lot of joy and enthusiasm. They just never seemed to really get around to clearly articulating the truth. Great production value, uh, things of that nature. Very exciting. Not much truth. We long to be a joy-filled, vibrant church that loves the Bible believes the Bible, applies the Bible, and lives the Bible. This is the type of culture of which we find in Paul's life and the culture he promoted. Here's the fourth area. I want us to see that Paul emphasized a culture of support. If you're still with me, say amen. You guys are a little sleepy today, to be honest with you. The first service was just loving this, just loving it. All right, number four, a culture of support. Verse 17 is an interesting one. I want you to look there. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. Now, I want you to appreciate how weird this is. He didn't say, oh, Archippus, or however you would say his name, here's my message for you. He said, church, I want you to say this to him. All right, Archippus, who was he? Well, we believe he stepped in to provide leadership for the church while Epaphras was away. We don't get a lot of context beyond that. Clearly, he was struggling. Clearly, 
Maybe he was struggling with some of the very issues Paul addressed in, in the course of this letter. I don't know, maybe after church, someone walked out and, and said it was too hot in there today. And then the next person said it was too cold. And then the next person said it was too loud in there. We've got to turn the music down. And someone else said, man, it's great. Turn it up. Uh, maybe it was somebody uh, complaining about the fact that they had protocols during a pandemic. I'm just saying that maybe was it. All right. Maybe it was someone else upset they even had church during a pandemic. I don't know. A number of things like that could have possibly uh, bummed out a pastor. Here are a couple things we do know. First, we know that the calling of Archippus was from God. The Bible says it was received in the Lord. And we know that he was to take heed to the ministry. Now, I thank God I get to be a pastor. I love it. I love it. I love the first service better than you guys today, to be honest with you. But that can change. It's a week-to-week thing. But I love being a pastor. It's, I love it. And uh, I, I thank God for our staff team here. I thank God for leaders at, at every, every level. You know, we do find a sense here that we're to encourage and to support one another. Let's know this. The stakes with which we deal are not life or death. They are eternal life and eternal death. And I can't rightly express to you how deeply I feel that, the weight of that responsibility. And Paul here did not say, Archippus, you need to do your work. He said, church family, tell him, support him, rally around this. This was kind of a passive aggressive way of the apostle Paul saying, guys, come on. Can you not see this guy struggling? Why don't you support the guy? Help him out. That's the kind of culture we want in our church. I won't go into this in great detail, but a few years ago, I, I, I don't know if I just got tired. I don't know what it was, um, but I kind of got discouraged, and, and uh, stuff was happening at the church. It's always, if, if you're making progress in life, it's generally uphill, and uh, stuff was happening in my life, and, and I made the decision, a bad decision, but my decision was I'm not going to tell anyone how I'm feeling for fear someone would criticize me for being discouraged. Dumb decision. And um, a few months went by. I was on a plane one day with my wife. I hadn't planned on talking to her, but I just began to tell her. I said, you know, I've been feeling this way. And how long? I said, well, really, a few months. And she said, man, you've got to talk to somebody. You should talk to the deacons. And I was in such a weird headspace. I thought, if I talk to the deacons, I'll be met with judgment. You know, like they'll be like, wait a minute, you're our pastor and you're discouraged? Well, you know, what in the world? You know, I can't believe this. I thought I'd get a little bit of that. And uh, I, you know, I didn't find judgment. I found grace. I found grace. Man, they cared. They loved me. They encouraged me. They helped me. And I was so thankful for that. I, I want you to know what they did is what we're finding in this passage of Scripture. They provided support. I think of another occasion. I'm not going to rehearse all we went through last year. You guys all went through a lot of stuff too. I know that. But I'm not telling your story. I'm telling mine right now. Pastoring over the last year, almost year and a half, it's been like unnerving. Everything changed in the beginning. It seemed like it changed almost every day. I would watch complete news conferences to try and get the information I need to make decisions. The news conference would end, and I'd look at my wife and be like, did any of that make any sense to you? He talked for an hour and said nothing at all, you know? And uh, I, I knew this. Anything I did, a big bunch of you didn't like it, and you were going to let me know that. What's up with that? Okay, so there was that. I just knew. There was nothing I could do. It's like, hey, let's wear masks. These people are mad. Let's not wear masks. These people are mad. And it was like, ah, oh, pulling my hair out, going crazy. And uh, uh, there were just all the ups and the downs. And that doesn't take into account we all have personal lives. And I had a lot going on in my personal life last year. And I'll never forget the day last fall, standing in a parking lot in Phoenix, Arizona, right before my mom's funeral service. And I felt lost, and it was because I was lost. If I would have been leading and planning that funeral, it would have been organized much better. Typically, I'll say, hey, the family should be here. You guys are going to sit here, these kinds of things. It just wasn't really organized very well. And I was standing there kind of lost and frustrated and profoundly sad. My mom, in my view, was the only consistently good thing in our family. Everyone else, myself included, marginal at best. And if you've lived long enough to lose, lose some people, you know it's never about just that one thing. It's the whole network and the doors for reconciliation and this or that closed and profound sadness. I'm standing there and a vehicle pulls in the parking lot and another vehicle and a group from our church pulled up 
They got up at four in the morning to drive to Phoenix. I didn't, I didn't ask anybody to come. I wouldn't have done that. But they knew I was hurting. They knew I was going to be there. And they knew I was dealing with something. They, they drove all the way from Oceanside to Phoenix to be there. And I, I've got to tell you, I don't really remember any words we exchanged during that time. Because it wasn't about the words. It was about just someone showing up in our lives. And, and that makes the difference. Friends, we're all going to encounter people in our church who are in their low times. And you will never know what your presence in their life can mean. Speaking to a group of pastors, Paul said, hey guys, I've showed you all things, how that's so laboring you ought to support the weak. You say, well, who's the weak? Well, you are. And I am. We need support. To an entire church in Thessalonica, Paul said, we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. This is not a job for a select few. It's not like the church hires me to be the supporter and I just go around and, and try and help people in that way. Each of us should develop this culture by doing what we can do to bear one another's burdens. Everyone has moments in life where they think quitting things they should not quit is a good idea. And it's always helpful when you're in a place that has a culture of support that leads to the final thought it was a culture of grace let's look at the final verse verse 18 still out there very good thank you verse 18 the salutation by the hand of me paul remember my bonds grace be with you Amen. Paul had to amen his own preaching sometimes too, you know. No one was saying amen, so he just said, I'll say it myself. Grace be with you. Friends, here it is. Paul concluded where he started. If we were to go back to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2, verse 1, he just kind of says, hey, it's me, Paul. And then he gets into verse 2. And how does he start the whole book of Colossians? He starts it by saying, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, friends, the culture of a church that accomplishes what Christ would have, it's rooted in the gospel of grace. It's saturated with grace. God's grace is undeserved favor. It's when God treats you not as you deserve, but he treats you as Christ deserves. It's God the Father looking at you and not seeing you as, your, as a sinner that you are and I am and seeing our imperfections, but seeing us through the work of Jesus Christ and treating us as though we're his son, Jesus. I want you to know that grace is God's one way, unthinkable, unearnable, saving, sanctifying, sustaining love, and he gives it to sinners like you and me. And grace is that concept when understood that helps us to understand that Jesus is enough. And it's a message we not only need to process and possess, it's a message we're to preach. Before our church began, I dreamed a lot about what it would be like. And most of my dreams were uh, physical. I'd see a building or an auditorium or I'm not talking about spooky dreams. I, you know, I just meant when I think about the future, it's like, man, what's it going to be like? And I think about that kind of stuff. And uh, those images in my mind were probably pretty normal for a 26-year-old kid who'd never been a pastor and never really preached much. I was just trying to imagine what's it going to be like. I have to tell you, my dreams have really, really changed. In those early days, I... I never thought beyond my generation. I spend a lot of time thinking about what kind of place are we going to hand off to the next generation. I, I believe my dreams are coming more into alignment with the culture the Apostle Paul put out here. I dreamed that we'd have a church that would have a culture 
of encouragement. We'd put wind in the sails of those around us, a, a culture, a family where we would work together, understanding we each bring gifts and talents and abilities and experience and, and a background and a perspective that we would have a culture that appreciates the Word of God, seeing the Bible as, as God's perfect Word and the source for our unity and our blueprint for life, a, a culture of support where we lift one another up when we're beneath the weight that this life brings, and a culture of grace where we comprehend him the greatness of Jesus and his love, recognizing that he is, always has been, always will be enough and more for whatever we face. Would you imagine with me what a church with a culture like that could do? I'd imagine if we became a church with a culture like that, we'd be a church where we could be blessed as individuals. Our families could be blessed and encouraged. And I'd go so far as to say it I'd imagine a church with a culture like that would be a place that could touch their community with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our Father, thank you for the privilege of opening your word and studying today. Lord, I hope this got through to somebody that you'd help us not to just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Lord, I pray that we'd be the kind of Christians that would hear a message like this and do our best to go about establishing that culture everywhere we go of living out these thoughts and points and concepts and help us we pray Lord thank you so much for joining us for this service today it's really our prayer and desire that God would allow these times in his word to encourage and help us and if that was the case in your life today we are grateful for that the Bible teaches us that really the most important thing in life is knowing that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if that's something that's on your heart and you have a desire for more information about that, we would encourage you to email us at pray at coastlinebaptist.org. We'd love to respond by forwarding you some information that I believe you would find helpful. And we would be more than happy to pray with you about any needs you have in your life. Again, I'm very thankful you've joined us for this service, and I'd like to encourage you, at some point in the near future, why don't you make plans to join us in person?